everyone. Good afternoon to those of you joining us on the West Coast, uh, excuse me, East Coast. Oh, adio. Uh, good morning to those of you joining us on the West Coast. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ethan Marcus. I am the Managing Director of the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America. It's the national umbrella organization for the Latino-speaking Sephardic communities of the United States. We're so happy to have you here. We're a very special class today. We're very excited to have, right before the holidays, Sephardic versus Ashkenazic liturgy, a study in comparative uh, thought with Rabbi Chaim Angel, our dear, dear friend. And this is in partnership with the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals and through our wonderful Sephardic Digital Academy, which if you haven't heard of, please go and check out our website and go to SephardicBrother.com slash Sephardic Digital Academy to check out all our wonderful courses on Sephardic Torah, philosophy, Latino language and culture, history, cooking. We have a wonderful cooking class coming up next week, in fact, and so much more. So please make sure to go check out our website. Just a little bit about our wonderful educator today, Rabbi Chaim Angel, who serves as a national scholar for the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals, teaches advanced Tanakh courses to undergraduates and rabbinical students at Yeshiva University and lectures widely. He received his BA in Jewish studies from Yeshiva College, his MA in Bible from the Bernard Revel Graduate School, his MS in Jewish Education from the Azraeli Graduate School of Jewish Education, and his rabbinic ordination from the Rabbi Isaac Elchanan Theological Seminary of Kishima University. He's published over a hundred scholarly articles, primarily in Tanakh, and is author or editor of 13 books. He lives in New York with his wife and three children, and we're so grateful to have him with us today. Rabbi Angel, whenever you are ready, Okay, thank you so much, Ethan, and hello, everybody. Uh, just thank God, first of all, it's wonderful to be here, and I really appreciate the Sephardic Brotherhood's invitation, as well as the Institute for Jewish Idea and Ideals. It's, it's been a wonderful eight years working with the with the institute. So thank you all for coming. Uh, just one thing, which I which I do need to correct, and that's not Ethan's fault. It always depends when you go online to find a bio. I, it matters when that bio was written. Thank God I now live in Teaneck, New Jersey, with my wife and four children. We've been blessed with two children since whenever that bio has been written. So I just want to let my boys have a have official recognition on this thing as well. Other than that, everything is pretty cool. I've written a few more books since that bio also, but that's, uh, that's, that's, that's smaller fish. Uh, one thing that's cool actually about the title that the Sephardic Brotherhood has given to the talk is that it's very different from mine. Uh, I don't know, Ethan, one thing I'm sorry to ask you. I see that I have power to admit people to the room. Am I supposed to be using that power or are you handling that? No, I'll take care of that. You don't Great. have to worry about that. I will, I will just keep right on going then. Thank you so much. Uh, I call the, the this talk Sephardic and Ashkenazic prayer, whereas I see that the flyer says Sephardic versus Ashkenazic prayer as though there's some kind of uh, contest because, of course, that's always jazzy or and more exciting. So, Ethan, thank you for making it sound more jazzy, but I just want everybody to understand that there's obviously no competition here. I think uh, as somebody who has, I grew up in the Spanish-Portuguese synagogue in New York City. My father was the rabbi there for many years. I served as a rabbi there for a time as well, and when you grow up in the Spanish-Portuguese community, you quickly learn how to pray every other way possible, because if you have any friends and you go to their synagogues, guess what? It's not Spanish Portuguese. So it's such a tiny, it's such a tiny, you know, world presence at this stage in the game. So I learned how to pray in many, many different ways. And that gave me the opportunity to appreciate, wow, we live in a miraculous time. And we all have access. We can go anywhere and hear so many different kinds of liturgy. And you can even go online. You don't even need to go to a synagogue with our collections of music and uh, medieval poems and all kinds of different compositions that we can study and really get a be able to benefit from the wisdom of the various communities over the centuries and how they came to be. The reality is anybody who knows who spends any time studying Sephardic and Ashkenazic and for that matter Italian or Yemenite or other you know communities as well uh, is that the differences are are minuscule. For all of the fuss that people like to make about differences or how things stand out. That's what we like to focus on because we are human beings and that's how our brains work. But the reality is that the core liturgy is biblical and rabbinic and far predates any Sephardic or Ashkenazic or any division of communities where different customs stand out. So it's always important to emphasize that when we focus on these differences to note those differences are nothing compared to the fundamental similarities between every traditional Jewish liturgy in the world. You can go to any synagogue, a traditional synagogue anywhere and feel comfortable, which is I think a miracle given the thousands of years that separate all, and all the different lands and communities that we've had. But this talk does focus on 
a handful of differences that I think help shed some light on broader communal biases that Sephardic and Ashkenazic communities had when they were developing the liturgy in the medieval period, the little quirks and nuances that made each one stand out, and just focus on a few of those, noting, again, that, that almost all of it is basically the same. Uh, here are some of the overarching things that I've found. There's a source sheet I see now. Thank, thank you for posting it. So if you did not already receive it, please do click on it so that way you have access to all the sources that I will be using. It's just two pages of sources. I see that the link is there in the chat. Uh, one thing that, that you'll find time and again is that typically speaking, the Sephardic Sidur, the Sephardic liturgy, has a much stronger biblical slant than the Ashkenazic one. Ashkenazic, the Ashkenazic liturgy tends to take a more rabbinic, midrashic sort of slant. And I wanted to give just a few examples so you can appreciate how prevalent this theme is. It doesn't mean 100% of the time, but, but there's no question that there are, are biases in these directions. If you read the Shabbat morning, we read a collection of psalms every morning. And then on Shabbat morning, different communities add additional psalms to the Shabbat morning liturgy. If you look at a Sephardic Sidur, those additional psalms are always going to be in the order that you will find these psalms in the book of Psalms. So they'll have 19, then 33, then Psalm 34, and so on. They will always be arranged in the order of the book of Psalms. So if you would ask the compilers of these Psalms, why did you choose this order? The answer is simple. It's like we opened up to Elim. We chose those Psalms that we thought were appropriate for Shabbat morning editions, and we simply arranged them in the order of the book of Psalms. If you look at an Ashkenazic Sidur, uh, they're not in that order. They're not in numerical order. There's a, there, are different, there, are different, there are different ways of doing it, but they always come out not in the order of the Book of Psalms. So you will find that there are articles written on why did Ashkenazic liturgy creators choose the Psalms and arrange them in this way? There must be a reason. They knew the order of the Book of Psalms, and they chose for some conceptual reason to order them differently. Sure enough, I've read such articles, and they're great, and they're probably close to the truth in terms of what the Ashkenazic uh, liturgy compilers were doing. They were trying to come up with some conceptual framework, and they organized the Psalms based on some idea that they had about what type of effect they wanted to have on prayer. And that's great, but that's a different bias from simply opening up the book of Psalms, plucking out those Psalms that are relevant for Shabbat morning, and placing them in that order. Another example that you have in your source sheets, in sources one, two, and three, Sfaradim and Ashkenazim on Shabbat afternoon, at least when there were otherwise would not have been supplication prayers added, recite a, a, liturgy, a li liturgy of three different verses from the Book of Psalms. They're plucked out of the Book of Psalms, and they all have the word Sidkatecha, God's righteousness, your righteousness, referring to God. Okay, so there are sources one, two, and three. So I'll read them in English, but you have the Hebrew in front of you as well. In Psalms order, your beneficence is like the high mountains. Your justice like the great deep, man and beast you deliver, O Lord. Your mighty acts to all who are come are to come, your beneficence, high as the heavens, O God. You have done great things, O God. Who is your peer? Your righteousness is eternal. Your teaching is true. There is a link. Okay, again, there's a link in the chat that you should be able to access on this drive Google thingy. So you can click on that and hopefully we'll be able to access it. If this continues to be a problem or if you're unable to access, I could share screen, but then I won't be able to see all of your wonderful faces. So my preference is always if you can click on the link way better. If that doesn't work for you, I will definitely access the sources because it's also way better for you to have sources in front of you. It seems like that thanks should suggest that we are good. Good. So I will continue to be good. Svaradim, read those three verses in the order that you have it in your source sheets, which is simply, look at the psalm numbers, in order of the book of psalms again. Here are three verses with the word Sidkatecha in it. One is Vit Sidkatecha, okay. It's your righteousness. And they're simply arranged in the order of the book of psalms. Ashkenazim pray these same three verses, but they reverse the order. They don't put it in the order of psalms. They put it in the exact opposite order. Again, eliciting rabbinic comment as to, well, why? because you need to ask, ask the question. As soon as you deviate from the, the, biblical, the biblical order, there has to be some reason for this. Ashkenazim knew the order of the Psalms as well, but the Sidur compilers obviously wanted something else. So one answer that is given by Rabbi Yehoshua Falk, who was one of the great rabbis of the 16th century in Poland, he suggests very reasonably that there's this ascending order of sanctity if you do it, quote unquote, backwards from the order of Psalms. Source three doesn't have God's name at all. So Ashkenazim recite that one first. 
the middle source, source two, you have the name God, which is Elohim in Hebrew, which is a sacred name of God. But then the third source number one ends with Hashem's actual name, Adonai. Okay, so Rabbi Yoshua Falk posits very reasonably that Ashkenazim wanted to have an ascending order of growth of holiness of these verses, starting with no mention of God's name to the mention of Elohim, which is a sacred name of God, to the mention of Adonai, which is God's personal name. That could very well be why those verses were arranged the way that they were in the Ashkenazic Sidur. All I can tell you is one order, the Sephardic order, is hewing to the biblical order, and the Ashkenazic order is hewing to a conceptual order, same as the Shabbat morning Psalms. Okay, here's another example. The Talmud debates, you know that there are two blessings prior to the Shema reading in the morning. There are also two blessings prior to the Shema re reading in the evening prayers. Okay, let's go back to the morning one. The first one is Yotzer Or Ubarei We praise God as the creator of the cosmos. And the second blessing celebrates God's particular relationship with the people of Israel. Okay, the question is, what words should we use to begin that blessing? So the Talmud already debates this. This actually goes back to the pre-Sephardic and Ashkenazic. The Talmud discusses what should the beginning of the, that second blessing be. So source number four, which is the other benediction? What is the other blessing referring to the second blessing before the Shema? Rabbi Yehuda said in the name of Shmuel, with abounding love, which is Ahava Rabba. That, is the, that became the Ashkenazic beginning of this prayer. Ahava Rabba is how Ashkenazim begin the prayer. So it goes back to the Talmud here. So also did Rabbi Elazar instruct his son, Rabbi Padat, to say with abounding love, Ahava Rabba. Okay. It has been taught to the same effect. We do not say with everlasting love, which is Ahavat Olam, but with abounding love. Okay, so there is a minority opinion in the source that follows what that adopts what becomes the Ashkenazic practice to begin this second blessing, Ahava Rabba. But the majority rabbinic opinion is what became the Sephardic view which is the rabbis, however, say that with everlasting love, Ahavat Olam is said. So it is also said, yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with affection, I have drawn you. They quote a verse from Jeremiah, which is mentioned here in source number six below. Source six is the Lord revealed himself to me of old. Eternal love I conceived for you then. Ahavat Olam Avtich. I have loved you eternally, says God to the people of Israel. Therefore, I continue my grace to you. Lovely, it's a beautiful verse. Oh, by the way, what was the biblical proof text for the first view in the Talmud? The second view, the dominant rabbinic view in this Talmudic passage says, oh, we say avat olam because there's a biblical verse that says avat olam. What is the proof text? What is the biblical source of avar rabba of the minority opinion that we saw as the first opinion in source four? The answer, of course, is there isn't any. There is no biblical verse avar rabba. That's why they're not quoting a verse. So funny enough, even though this is already a Talmudic view, the Ashkenazic practice became to adopt the non-biblical opinion, one where the rabbis concocted the formula for the blessing, whereas the Sephardic view became the one where the rabbis simply drafted a verse from, from the book of Jeremiah, from a biblical verse. And that's exactly what happened. Ashkenazim, the Mishnah Berurah, this, you know, this is one of the great halachic works of the, of the early, late 19th, early 20th century that has huge authority in the Ashkenazic world. The Mishnah Berurah explains that Ashkenazim liked Ahava Rabba because it, it makes a midrashic play off of a verse in the Book of Lamentations, which is in source number five. They are renewed every morning, which is Rabba, ample is your grace. Rabba emunah techa. So that is the Ahava Rabba. So it's a midrashic play off of a biblical verse, but it's not a biblical verse. There is no biblical verse, Ahavar Rabba, that the Talmudic view that became the Ashkenazic practice takes. Rather, it's a conceptual framework that is there. Whereas the Sephardic world, including Rif and Rambam and so many others said, Sephardim chose the second view for the very simple reason that it draws off of an actual biblical formulation. Okay, so we've already seen three examples where the Sephardic liturgy tends to favor the biblical text much more than the Ashkenazic world, whereas the Ashkenazic liturgy tends to favor a more conceptual midrashic compilation, drawing from biblical sources, of course, but certainly spinning it much more into a midrashic framework. We saw that with the Psalms of Shabbat morning. We saw this with the Tzidkat prayer in Shabbat afternoon. And now we are seeing this just with the initial formula of the second blessing before Shema in the morning. 
take a break, traffic time. I call the chat traffic. I've been doing this for a year and a half by now, as I guess many of us have been. Why does Evertilim have the Tzidkat verses in a particular order or general? Ah, so that's a, that's a very deep question. I have a very easy answer for you. I have no idea. Okay, so I, the, when I teach a course in Psalms, I give a longer winded sentence to, I still have no idea. But, but in general, nobody has ascertained a full, fully compelling or even a moderately compelling explanation for the complete order of the Psalms, the way that they are placed. There are five different collections that are assembled there, and it's very difficult to ascertain. Uh, sometimes you can guess, you can see that similar title verses or words are associated in Psalms, but after that, it becomes a lot tougher. But for these three verses, they're just plucked out. I mean, it's not even Psalms with the, that as a theme. It's much more just three verses that happen to have the word Tzidkatecha. So the early rabbis who formulated that liturgy liked this word for that part of the day because of the theme of Shabbat afternoon. And so they, they drew the same verses, but the ordering, I think, I think is what it's telling. But, I, but even if we had a much longer conversation, you would find, I still have no idea. So good. Okay, um, more broadly, there's a really interesting debate in the Sephardic Ashkenazic world. It, it's, a, it's a related issue to just a biblical bias. It has to do with, here's one area where Sephardim and Ashkenazim really do have a very strong difference in the prayer book, and that has to do, of course, with medieval prayers. Anything that is biblical or rabbinic is heavily the same. Yes, you might have different order of psalms or verses. You might have slightly different formulations in the text for the Amidah or whatever, but they're really slight compared to the overall fact that they are the fundamentally same structure of prayer and the same prayers. Uh, there are minor variations. When it comes to medieval poetry, what we call piyut, there there are strong differences simply because Sephardim drew from Sephardic Paitanim po poets typically rabbis, but you didn't have to be a rabbi to write a poem. And the same with the Ashkenazic world. They simply drew, they, they, they made their own poetry. So that's where you will find the strongest differences in liturgy. So during the high holiday season, which is right around the corner, if you have a Sephardic and an Ashkenazic prayer book in front of you, you will actually have significant differences just with regard to the actual words that you will say, just because of the medieval elements of the prayer book. Okay, so... It happens that in the medieval period, there was actually a very fierce battle, which of course everybody ignored, because once it's in your siddur, you're gonna say it. You know how that works. But that didn't stop the rabbis from having very forceful debates over what proper piyut, what proper, what are the proper guidelines for a prayer? So you'll find in source number seven, there's a verse in the book of Kohelet, Ecclesiastes. I apologize for the phone ringing. This hopefully will stop soon. Name unavailable tends to call me a lot, as I'm sure they call you as well. And so you just deal with what you got to deal with it. All right, here goes. Source seven. The verse is talking about not making rash vows, okay? Like back in the good old days when the temple stood, so you could make a vow to bring a, an animal sacrifice. So Kohelet warns, as does the Torah, don't make rash vows because you may not fulfill them, and that would be terrible. Keep your mouth from being rash, and let not your throat be quick to bring forth speech before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. That is why your words should be few. In the context of those verses, you could look it up yourself. You will see it's talking about making vows. But if you pluck this verse out of context, which happened big time in the medieval period, this was the verse around which there was a huge war over these medieval poems. So if you want to read a really lengthy Ibn Ezra where he goes on a tirade, this is Rabbi Abraham Ibn Ezra who lived in 12th century Spain and then migrated to various lands at different points in his, in his career and lifetime. Uh, he goes berserk against what became the core of Ashkenazic PU. He thought it was terrible and he does not, he does not hold back punches at all. Uh, here's why he thinks that they're terrible. One thing he has a problem with is that typically speaking, if you are Ashkenazic or read Ashkenazic Piyut, you will find that they are almost incomprehensible, even with a good translation. That bothers Ibn Ezra to no end. Well, you know who it's good for, by the way, people writing doctoral dissertations today, it's a really hot topic. There's a huge field in PU decoding where doctoral students spend many, many, many years decoding these prayers, trying to come up with the references and their meanings and their allusions and all of that. Ibn Ezra's point is, if you're going to write a prayer that's going to appear in a, in a siddur, in a prayer book, for all Jews to recite, you need those Jews to be able to understand it. And if it's speaking in riddles and complicated allusions, uh, that's bad. So he, he goes on a tirade against that. 
while he's on the subject of this tirade, again, I'm just summarizing a very lengthy tirade. If you want to read it, it's on, it's, it's Ibn Ezra's comments on Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. This ver source 7 over here, look up Ibn Ezra on the spot. He goes, he really, really is upset with what he considers unfit PUs. A second problem he has is that many of these PU team use Aramaisms to rabbinic language instead of simply using pure, pristine Hebrew. That bothers him too. He says that you can, when we learn Talmud, we can learn Aramaic, but when you pray, that should be in Hebrew. He observes with great bitterness that many of these poems also contain many grammatical errors. And that bugs him to no end. He says, if you're standing before God, you should stand intelligent, educated, and your prayer should be written by people who know Hebrew. So he's very, very upset about that as well. And then he also says that, here this goes back to the Sephardic Bible bias, uh, the meanings of the biblical verses should correspond to what the verses actually mean, rather than playing off of midrashic rabbinic twists on these meanings. So for these four and probably some other reasons too, he concludes that it is much better not to say any of these piyutim ever. It is a disgrace before God than to recite them. And obviously, if it is your custom to say them, please do continue to say them. I'm not trying to dissuade you. I'm just trying to say that Ibn Ezra would try to dissuade you. Another rabbi in the Sephardic world in the medieval period who had a big problem with Piyut was Rambam, Maimonides. He had a very serious problem with the types of Piyut team that were being bandied around, and he rejected them likewise. Uh, if you want to hear a great justification of the Hebrew uh, stretches it's really good. Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, the great Rosh Yeshiva at Yeshiva University for many, many years, he passed away in 1993 and really one of the great rabbinic lights of the 20th century in general. Uh, in his commentary on the Tisha B'Av Piyutim, which again are, are very difficult to understand, he praises these authors for, here's a quote, for breaking the bounds of the Hebrew language. He considers this poetic greatness. Rather than saying like Ibn Ezra, these guys didn't know Hebrew, he's saying, of course they knew Hebrew, but they stretched the language through their poetry, which by the way is very plausible. I don't, I don't think that one is right and one is wrong. That's a very positive spin on the same situation. Rabbi Soloveitchik very forcefully defended these, these poems as anybody in the Ashkenazi community would. These are sacred texts. One thing Rabbi Soloveitchik in his writings did add is that he didn't think that anybody today is qualified to write any piyut. He venerated the medieval poems, but he personally felt that there is nobody today who should be able to compose new prayers. You could agree or disagree with that, but that's what he said. He, he did take a Rambam-like stand about contemporary prayers, but he certainly defended the medieval prayers as being excellent and beautiful and certainly sacred. Okay, so this is another area where you will find a significant difference between the Sephardic and Ashkenazic liturgy, precisely because poems are, are, they were written in the medieval period in Sfarad and in Ashkenaz, so they actually do reflect different traditions and different styles of what type of prayer is considered appropriate, okay? One of my personal favorite Ashkenazic prayers, which does not appear in the Sephardic liturgy, is on Shabbat morning in the Shacharit, in the prayer that we call the Kiddusha. Kiddusha is the sacred centerpiece of the repetition of the Amidah, where we as human beings, as a community, stand with the angelic host in praising God. It's a wonderful thing. Both, both the Sephardic and Ashkenazic prayers are beautiful. There was a rabbi, he was a rabbi in Queens, in New York for many years. His name was Rabbi Marvin Luban. He died a few years ago. He wrote an article back in the 1960s that I think is just wonderful. He said that there was a practice which neither Sephardim nor Ashkenazim do, but there was a practice back in the medieval period in some communities to recite the Kiddushah, this prayer, only on Shabbat and not on weekdays. Sephardim and Ashkenazim all recite it on weekdays. We, we, we have abandoned that practice, but there were those communities who felt that it was important to recite only on Shabbat. So Rabbi Luban says that Sephardim and Ashkenazim had different ways of thinking about Shabbat and weekdays. And this is really kind of cool, based on this prayer that, I'm, that we'll read in source number eight in just a minute. There are two sacred prayers that we have that really form the heart of communal prayer. One is this Kiddusha, where we recite this in the repetition of the Amidah, where we, again, as we stand as a community with the angelic host in praising God. And there is a different prayer that we call the Kaddish. Many people wrongly associated with a mourner's prayer just because mourners do say it, but it was not composed as a mourner's prayer at all. The Kaddish is a prayer about a broken world, 
that God is in exile as are we, and we praise for God to bring redemption, that God's name will be whole. So Kaddish is actually comes from the depths of our sorrow in the exile, and we pray for God to redeem us so that God can redeem himself, whereas the Kedusha is serenity. We are so super spiritual. We are standing with the angelic host. We are, it's a very different kind of prayer. So a relic of the Kedusha for Shabbat and Kaddish for weekdays comes up on this, this prayer in source number eight. Ashkenazim add a prayer to the Kedusha of the morning of Shabbat that Sephardim did not add. Here it goes in source number eight. From your place, this is called the Mim Komcha. All right, so you have it again in the Hebrew in front of you as well. From your place, our king, you will appear and reign over us, for we await you. When will you reign in Zion? Soon in our days, forever and ever, may you dwell there. May you be exalted and sanctified. In Hebrew, it's Titkadal Titkadash, within Jerusalem, your city, from generation to generation and for all eternity. May our eyes see your kingdom, as is expressed in the songs of your might, written by David, your righteous anointed. It's a beautiful prayer. It's a heartfelt plea to God to redeem us. And you feel the depths of pain of exile in this paragraph. And it even has Titkadal Kadash. It's clearly bringing the Kaddish in the, into the Kedusha. Okay. Sephardim said, and that's how the Sephardic practice goes, there's a place for, there's a time to say Kedusha and there's a time to say Kaddish, but they're not the same time. Kedusha is spiritual serenity. You're with the angels. Kaddish is when you feel the world is broken and you, it, you let out this cry of anguish over the imperfections of this world. Ashkenazim brought this Kaddish into the Kiddushah and Shabbat morning, clearly reflecting a pained time in their, in their existence. They felt that even when we're standing before God and the angelic host, we can't ignore the sorrow around us. Please redeem us. So Ardim said, let's pray for, pray for redemption, but somewhere else. And so you see a relic of this Kiddusha only on Shabbat in this, in this divergent practice. Just to give one other example where Sephardim and Ashkenazim felt different about when to introduce the Messianic plea, there's a, the first blessing of the morning, of the morning pre-Shema is Yotzer uh, Oru Borei Choshech, I mentioned before. Ashkenazim add a line at the end of that blessing, which is Or Chadash Al Tzion Ta'ir, right? God, please shed new light Onto Zion. It's a prayer for redemption. Rabbi Sadia Gaon, this was an old, this was an old part of the prayer. Rabbi Sadia Gaon rejected that. He said, Of course we want God to shine a new light on us, but this prayer is about God as the creator of the cosmos. This is not a prayer for redemption. So let's pray for redemption somewhere else and keep stick to the script about this is God as the creator, awesome God creator of the cosmos. And so that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with Sardim and Ashkenazim, of course, both, of course, both want redemption. The question is, where do you ask for it? Ashkenazim ask for it even in a prayer celebrating God as creator, and even during the Kiddusha when we're standing with the angelic host. Sardim say, no, those are two places where we don't pray for redemption because these two blessings and prayers have nothing whatsoever to do with redemption. So it's a matter of whether you want to bring the outer woes into the inner sanctum or not. I think it's a wonderful distinction between the Sephardic and Ashkenazic liturgy. Okay, another area where Sephardim and Ashkenazim uh, diverge, of course, has to do with just the cultural influence of music. The musical score that you will find in different, in different prayers, uh, it can really set the mood, even if you don't know Hebrew and have no clue what you are doing. And if you walk into a Sephardic room on Yom Kippur and everybody's going, so on and so forth. It's a wonderful prayer. You would have no idea that all of us are saying, God, we have sinned before you. Please forgive us. It sounds like we're at a wedding, right? I think that's a great example of, of Sephardic liturgy having this very upbeat tone, even in this awesome day of Yom Kippur, which Yom Kippur is deemed by the Talmud as the happiest day of the year because God forgives us. Even so, that type of melody is so festive, it's, it's staggering that it's in the middle of this, this heartfelt plea for forgiveness. Uh, and the flip side is when you get a good chazan in an Ashkenazic synagogue, so what do we hear? Chaim shel bracha, chaim shel shalom. A very tearful 
chazanus. There's no good way to say chazanut here because chazanut is something different. But chazanus, when you really go for it, it sounds like you're at a funeral, even though you're just praying for a wonderful month ahead of you with great prosperity and peace and, and blessing of all different kinds. And again, this sort of music definitely sets a mood that the compilers of the liturgy and, of course, the, chaz the great chazanim who helped set the musical tunes for all of these different for all these different words, they, they chose these things very consciously. They were trying to set a, a different type of a mood. One thing that's cool nowadays, that's what I, that's what I preface today's talk, uh, it's a blessing that we can all sit together and we can go to any synagogue and, and, and experience so many different types of melodies. In the good old days, when Sephardim and Ashkenazim really lived in Sephardic and Ashkenazic lands, they very often never came into contact with one another. So there's a really cool story of a Rabbi Simcha Bar Yehoshua. He was an Ashkenazic rabbi in the 19th century, I think, who was on a boat going to Israel as a tourist. He was just going to Israel. And there were some Sephardim on the boat. And so he heard Sephardic liturgy for the very first time. And it was during the month of Elul, exactly where we are now, where Sephardim have the custom to say Selichot, the, the penitentiary, penitentiary, penitentiary prayers uh, throughout the entire month of Elul. And Rabbi Simcha Bar Yoshua wrote some kind of diary where he wrote, on the entire voyage, we pray penitential prayers, excuse me. Uh, we prayed with the Sephardim. The Sephardim awoke prior to daybreak to say Slicha with a quorum, as is their custom in the month of Elul. During the day, they eat and rejoice and are happy of heart. Some of them spend their entire days in study. He was, he was reporting on the, a Sephardic part of the culture that he simply had never heard of and never, and, and never saw. He never had experienced it. He was not expecting the Sephardic liturgy to be so joyous sounding during this month of, of, of repentance. But all the same, that's what he was able to experience. I remember when I was at Yeshiva Kotel, when I was a student, you know, my gap year. Uh, so there was a Sephardic and Ashkenazic minyan on, on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. And so I went to the Sephardic minyan for part of it, and I went to the Ashkenazic minyan for part of it, because I, I enjoyed both very much, and each one sets a different mood. So I wanted my soul to experience different parts of that. So the Rosh Hashiva spoke in both minyanim, and he gave a beautiful tear, you know, really heartfelt, beautiful, moving, he was crying speech. In the Ashkenazic minyan, that speech was fantastic. In the Sephardic minyan, the exact same speech, which was pretty much verbatim, the same thing with the same tears and everything, just didn't work. Right? The mood was so upbeat and everybody was pounding the tables and everybody was in such a joyous mood. And all of a sudden he comes in and starts crying. There was no crying to be had in the Sephardic minyan and Yom Kippur, at least not in my minyan that I was in. So I was, I was able to benefit from both sides of it and appreciate it. It was this good moment as an 18 year old. Wow, there, uh, it's such a, the music so much sets the tone that the same exact speech, which was an excellent speech by, by any measure, uh, really worked so well and effectively in one, but really didn't translate it all into the other one. There simply were different, there simply were different, different, different tunes. Okay, so we've covered Psalms, biblical bias, medieval poetry, and music. Let's turn over to the traffic for a second. Can you talk about the difference between Sephardic and Ashkenazi going into the Shema on the Musaf of Shabbat? Shema Omrim and Omrim Ba'ava. Uh, I don't, that's a good question. I don't know the specifics to that particular one, so I can't comment on it intelligently or even unintelligently. I just don't know. But it, again, the, I'm not surprised that everybody's trying to invoke the Shema there, but I, I don't know who formulated these particular things or if there is some ideological distinction or simply another good way of describing the same things. Why are words pronounced differently, Shabbat versus Shabbos, et cetera? Um, I don't know. These, I mean, the different pronunciations across the diaspora are, are old. I mean, these are very, very old traditional spellings. Uh, just to get a sense, not, not spellings, pronunciations. All I can tell you is Jews have had different pronunciations of Hebrew going back to the biblical period. You find this in a biblical story of a man named Yiftach. He was one of the, in the book of so-called Judges, Sefer Shepatim, where he found that the people from the tribe of Ephraim had a slightly different pronunciation of a word called Shibolet. And so the tribe of Menashe were able to tell from their accent and the way they pronounced the words, oh, you're obviously from Ephraim and not from us. And then they would kill you because they were in the middle of a civil war, unfortunately. But leaving aside the tragic episode that this story is about, uh, the fact is that ancient Israelites themselves in the biblical period already expressed Hebrew differently. And uh, it's not at all surprising to me that the more time that goes by and the more countries we live in, the more those variances would creep in. I don't know the history of these variances, but, but all I can tell you is that it goes back to the very beginning. 
Yeah, very cute. <laughs> okay, it's a good. It's a good. It's a good expression of you know bringing bringing death to the cemetery to our door. Very good way of describing that. Thank you for for the proverb, but it's 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 definitely true. It was so out of place, and and it was a great. It was a great speech, but it, it just didn't fit in that room. Uh, another another just moving to a different arena. Uh, Haftarot. Haftarot are the prophetic passages that different communities chose to incorporate. The Talmud simply codifies that we must read some prophetic passage every Shabbat or Yom Tov alongside the Torah reading. But whereas the Talmud does give us guidance for which Haftarot to read on, on Yom Tov, which is why Sephardim and Ashkenazim recite the same ones, it gave no guidance in terms of specific passages for regular Shabbatot. The result is different communities chose different ones, and it's only thanks to the printing press that so many communities' minor variances have vanished, because now suddenly everybody has the same kumash, and we all use the same thing, and that's the way that it's going to be. But even in these printed kumashim, like the Hertz kumash or Arts Scroll, or whichever one you choose to use, you will find that there still are variances between Sephardic and Ashkenazic practice. And most of the time, not always, most of the time you will find a little star or some, some kind of note Sephardim end here, right? If you've read both, you will find that on average, if there is a difference and they're reciting from the same passage, Sephardim might cut it short earlier and you'll have a little indicator saying Sephardim end here. So part of this seems to be that the rabbis of the Sephardic community seem to be concerned about passages that are too long, either because the people were getting restless or they started to talk or whatever it was, or alternatively, Ashkenazic rabbis either insisted on the longer passage because it was better learning or because the people really sat in synagogue quiet, more quietly, although I doubt it. I think, I think it's more just the optimism of let's do the whole passage. But whatever the rationales were, you do see relics of Sephardim tended to be less patient and Ashkenazim tended to be more patient, at least the, as far as the rabbis went or what they read into their communities. My favorite example of this happens to be my Bar Mitzvah parashat, it's parashat Vayera. Both Sephardim and Ashkenazim read from the same biblical story of Elisha. It's in the second book of Kings, chapter four. Elisha is the prophet, and there was a woman who was barren, and Elisha blessed her that she should have a child, and she gave birth to a child. Wonderful. She had a son. And the son grew and unfortunately seems to have died as a child. So the woman went running off to Elisha. Elisha comes back and, and prays at the boy's bedside, and the boy comes back to life. So it's a wonderful, happy ending. It's a great miracle. And, and it's, of course, parallel to the Abraham and Sarah story of the Torah reading of that day, where God blessed them that they would give birth to a child. Okay, so there, there are a lot of links between the two stories. Okay, it's a wonderful story in the prophetic books. I love it myself. Okay, Sephardim don't read to the end of the story. Sephardim, the kid is dead, and the woman goes out to find the prophet, and the husband says, hey, where are you going? And so source number nine is where Sephardim end this Haftarah. But he said, why are you going to him today? That's the husband talking to his wife who's going to seek the prophet. It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. She answered, it's all right, or in Hebrew, shalom. In your Chumashim, you will find Sephardim end here. Now, what's amazing about Sephardim end here is the kid is still dead at that point in the story, okay? It's a horrible place to stop. You, let, him, let him come back to life. It's a really glorious ending. The bad news is, if you let him come back to life, that's going to cost you 14 additional verses to read, which makes the Haftarah inordinately long. So Sephardim, Sephardic rabbis in the medieval period said, sorry, kid, we got to end here because the people in the congregation are getting restless. And as Ashkenazim said, let's read to the end, even if that means reading a really long Haftarah. So I think that's the best example of Sephardim end here, where it cuts the story in half specifically at a place where from a learning point of view, I wouldn't have advised it. You, you, you let the kid come back to life. It's a grand story. Let that happen. But the 14 additional verses were a decision maker for, for the Sephardic communities, whereas Ashkenazim said, let's read the whole passage, even at the expense of a much longer Haftarah. Okay. There's one other, one other area that we'll cover for today, and that has to do with the, the censor. In Christian lands, primarily where Ashkenazim lived, there, was, there were censors all the time that became very sensitive to parts of the liturgy that at least were perceived by Christians as anti-Christian. The truth is the, the liturgy, for the most part, predates Christianity and has nothing to do with Christianity. But all the same, there were some fusses in the medieval period, and that required 
deleting or altering various formulations. One of the most conspicuous places, which is really interesting, is in the prayer that we call the Alenu. In the Alenu prayer, there is a there is a line that goes back. It's part of the original prayer. That they, the idolaters, bow down to nonsense. And we, the next verse, and to, they pray to a God who will not save them. But we, the Jews, we bow down to God. That's how the prayer goes. Now, the line that's in the Alenu prayer goes back to two different verses. It's an amalgam of two different verses that you have here in sources 10 and 11. One is in Isaiah chapter 30. For the help of Egypt shall be vain and empty. That's Hevel Varik. Truly I call this, they are a threat that has ceased. So that's the Hevel Varik part, the vain and empty. And then Isaiah chapter 45 is come gather together, draw nigh, you remnants of the nations. No foreknowledge had they who carry their wooden images and pray to a God who cannot give success. That's the Mitpalalim, El El Lo Yoshia part. You have that all in the Hebrew. So this line that's part of the original Alenu prayer uh, is it goes back to these two biblical verses. It's an amalgam. The rabbis made, made prayers like this all the time. Now, the Alenu prayer goes back to like the second century CE in Babylonia. It's, it's, it's probably predates Christians living in Babylonia, and it was written in Babylonia. It's a very ancient prayer. In the good old days, it was recited only during the high holidays. Around 1300 or so, that's when it became part of the daily prayer book, and suddenly it was very conspicuous. Now, it's a, anybody who looks at the Jewish prayer book will see this Alenu prayer all the time. So in f around 1400, France and Germany were the first places to censor that line. And that's because a Jewish apostate, somebody who converted to Christianity, claimed that this line specifically targets Jesus and Christianity. That when it says that they bow down to nonsense, that's referring to Jesus and Christianity. But we pray to the true God. So the rabbis protested vigorously. They said this prayer predates Christianity. This prayer is an anti-pagan polemic. It has nothing whatsoever. It just was written long before there was a Christian world. There, it's not an anti-Christian polemic. It's, the prayer is too old. So the rabbis bitterly protested to defend this line, but the Christian authorities accepted this apostate's argument. And so that line became banned in Ashkenazic prayer books, which is why standard Ashkenazic prayer book doesn't have it anymore. In recent times, certain Ashkenazic prayer books have put it, in, put it back into the Siddur, in, typically in parentheses, because it really is part of the essential prayer. But on the other hand, because for centuries Ashkenazic Jews did not recite it, so it's weird to just put it back in there as though nothing has happened, so it often ends up in parentheses, which becomes very confusing. So now do you say it or not? Okay, but, but in the meantime, that's the origin of, of what's going on over here. In 1703, Prussian guards actually put guards in synagogues, by the way, to ensure that Jews did not recite that line. There was a lot of sensitivity about it. So the, despite all of, these, all of these protests. Now, there's another funny practice. I've never seen this. I, I, funny in the sense of it's, it, there's a cute quirkiness to it, even though... I, I don't like the idea of spitting inside of a synagogue. I don't even like spitting on the street so much. I think it's kind of gross. But inside of a synagogue, I find it most distasteful. Uh, but they're actually in certain Ashkenazic prayer books. You know how you have in all prayer books, you might have instructions. Bow here, stand here, sit here. Well, in certain prayer books, when you came to that line, it said, spit here. And that, the idea here is, Shehemit palalim lahevel varik. Reek means emptiness or, non, or nothingness, but that's very similar to the Hebrew word for spit, which is rok. So there actually developed a practice in certain Ashkenazic lands to spit, and many exactly at that line. And there were even instructions put in certain prayer books to spit at that moment, you know, to disgrace pagan deities. So rap, poor rabbis, of course, protested vigorously all over the place, saying, this is horrible. This is so distasteful. We don't spit in synagogue. It's a sacred place. But that didn't stop the spitters. There was even a Yiddish expression. If you wanted to make fun of a very serious latecomer, the Yiddish expression was, I don't know how to pronounce it exactly, but er kumt zum ushpayin, which means here comes the spitter, meaning somebody came so late in the synagogue, they're coming during the Alenus. They call this person the spitter. When I lived on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, 
So uh, there was an expression JFK, which means just for Kiddush. Uh, so those were people who came just at the, you know, they didn't even make it to the Alein. They showed up just for the food after tefillah was completely, after prayers were completely over. But all the same, there was this expression that you would find in instructions that you would find in prayer books. And even after that line got banned in Ashkenazic liturgy, that people were not reciting it anymore, there were still some prayer books that retained the instruction to spit, even though you were no longer saying that line. Sephardim, of course, didn't have this, so they simply retained the original text. In any Sephardic Sidur, you will have Shehem Yishtachav in the Hevel Varig. This is a good example where there's a lot of history embedded in, in this case, a, the disappearance of a single line. And it's good to know that. It's, it's good to see here's the original prayer. Here's the very tragic history in Ashkenazic lands of accusations against the Jews because of this line and how forcefully uh, Christian censors applied their might against the very vulnerable Jewish community and forced them to stop saying this line. Now, at least we live in an age where Ashkenazic Sidurim can choose to reprint it, and many do, just because of the freedom that, thank God, that we have. Okay, let's turn to traffic for a minute. Um, hold on. Okay, much of the Ashkenazic mood and the many additions to liturgy seem to have to do with the tragedies of Jewish history. Yes. I mean, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. There certainly were prayers, you know, after the the expulsion. The thing is that m many of the medieval poets that uh, poems that we have in our prayer book predate the expulsion, which is why those prayers obviously don't reflect the expulsion at all. But there certainly were prayers written at that time as well. I have a theory that the differences reflect different traumas. Ashkenazic is followed by the trauma of the Crusades, followed by the trauma of exile and expulsion. I'm sure that that's, again, very reasonable, which is precisely why the medieval poems that you'll find in the Sephardic Sidur don't focus on that trauma because it's, they're, they were written before that. In Aret, I so often attended Temanish about services but for Rosh Hashanah evening. I so missed the Ashkenazic Nisach and Melodies. I had to go back to Shacharit, back to the Ashkenazic services. I think of all times, I couldn't agree more. The high holiday season is where it is most difficult to be flexible because there are deepest feelings connect to the tunes, not to mention the words of whatever we grew up with. I, to me, I always advise anybody who could possibly do this on a regular Shabbat to explore. It's always worth, you know, you should have a synagogue that you go to regularly and that you're a member of, but whenever possible to experience a different type of liturgy of any kind, it's well worth it. When I used to go to Yerushalayim every summer, I would specifically go to the Italian synagogue just because this was my one shot at that. So I was like, let's go for the Italians. And it was great. It had a whole different haunting uh, liturgy that simply was unlike anything that I was used to in, in, even in New York City where there was plenty of variety. So to me, there was just this opportunity. Okay, let's pick up on a different, pick up on a different one. But for the high holidays, that's much harder to do. Where's Chabad fall in in this regard? Uh, that it depends for what. Here it's better just to talk to a Chabad expert who can who can really guide you through where they picked up, you know, Hasidut in general, drew many traditions from the Sephardic Sidur following the Ari, Rabbi Yitzchak Luria's mystical approach to the Sidur, and so many Hasidic communities adopted, you know, some form of the Sephardic Sidur as well, and as a result, it is a hybrid. Bera uh, Chaim, House of Life, one hopefully way to say cemetery, very good. Maybe the Sephardic stopping at a pivotal point in Atra is also meant to inspire people to read the end of the story. I wish everybody were as motivated as you. I, I remember when I was in graduate school for education, so one of the teachers said you should never skip any passage of the Torah because, of course, all the kids will immediately want to see, whoa, what did he skip? What did he skip? I raised my hand. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. When I was in third grade, we were only too happy to skip. Nobody looked. And, and I, I'm sure if, as long as you don't make a big deal about it, if the teacher just says open to the next chapter, you're thinking, wow, the teacher accidentally skipped something. That's awesome. Let's see if he can skip some more next time. I, I, I don't think any of us were, were our, curiosity was, our curiosity was not stoked. I only learned of some of the passages that we skipped in third and fourth grade, which was the appropriate thing to do. Uh, in high school. I was like, whoa, there are all these stories here I never heard of before. And I was very startled to see that they were right there in the Torah, but, and then it was at least, I had more tools to deal with them than I would have when I was nine. Maybe the Sephardic, okay, we already read that, maybe. There's always Rome. Okay, good. I think we are hereby up to date. All right, so let's wrap it up. Uh, so just to review the points that we've done today, most of the Sephardic and Ashkenazic prayer books are, and, and liturgies are astonishingly similar. It's actually an amazing thing that even though we lived apart for a thousand years with, with some communication to be sure, but not an immense amount of communication, uh, it's incredible to see the biblical and the rabbinic layers of the structural structure of prayer that are 
pretty much identical. There might be minor nuances here and there, but really minor, and none that would drastically affect the overall structure and content of the prayer. Uh, when there were choice areas, and we, that's what today's whole talk was about, you know, that one little zone, because that's what makes it all interesting, right? The little differences that we have, uh, whether it's the ordering of Psalms, whether it were selection of verses from Psalms, whether it's the medieval poetry, whether it's the musical tastes, whether it's the Haftarot, uh, wherever medieval rabbis and communities had choices, that helps us, uh, to me, a talk like this is very worthwhile just to see what we can learn from one another. It's really wonderful to be able to explore and be exposed to many different communities just because I think it really broadens our own souls and helps us appreciate what we were taught, whatever that we is and whatever we were taught. But it also gives us an opportunity to explore far beyond our own boundaries. And, and that just, you know, brings us to the celebration of the fact that we have so much access to so many different you know, Jews of so many different communities today that we never had before. And whatever you can't get to in your neighborhood, you can get to online. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a blessing to be able to hear the different musical choices, to see the different liturgical choices, and to be able to just develop our own understanding of what prayer is. And through that, of course, connect closer to God. So that's what I wanted to say for today. I see that there are more more traffic coming in. So let's check this out. Ashkenazi practice of reciting the first and last line of the prayer as well as Friday. You know, that's a that's an interesting question. I've always wondered that as well. I'll bet you in the good old days, there was a lot more chanting. I'll bet you the chanting thing is older. You even have relics of that in the book of Psalms with that Kiel Olam Chasdo chorus that you'll find in various Psalms. These Psalms were clearly chanted where there might be a reader or a choir that were the leaders and then everybody else would, would chime in. Uh, where the quickness came where you just recite the first and the last line and, and kind of mumble through the middle uh, may have to just do with the fact that people have to get to work it may have to do with the fact that save the reader's breath i don't know i don't know the origin of when that came to be it's a really interesting question it's, it's certainly noticeable that Sephardim are much more likely to chant all of the psalms out loud whereas ashkenazim typically do what you just said you know read the first and the last line or the you know beginning of the end of the prayer everything else is silent Okay, so that's just more on the Chabad thing. I, I think that, again, I think Hasidic communities in general derived hybrids from the Sephardic and Ashkenazic world. It's fundamentally an Ashkenazic prayer book. It's called, ironically, Nusach Sephard, right? But it's not Sephardic. Real Sephardic liturgy is Sephardic, and Ashkenazic is Ashkenazic. Nusach Sephard is Ashkenazic with some Sephardic twists. It is not at all a hybrid in the sense of 50-50. So just so that you know, it's not, I'm not saying better or worse. It's simply the way that it is. Ashkenazim had Sidurim first. I mean, is that true? The first Sidur ever written was by Rabbi Amram Gaon in Babylonia for the Jewish community of Spain in 875 CE. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know who had widespread, but that doesn't mean that it was widespread. The Jews in Spain simply wanted to know, dear rabbi, how should we pray? because the center of Torah study was still Babylonia then. So the Jews of Sepharad didn't have their own chachamim yet who were telling them, here's how we should pray. And so they appealed to Babylonia, which was the leading community of that time. Oh, printing first. Okay, interesting. Very good. All right, good. So I think we are good. If you have any other comments or questions, this is a wonderful time to do that. Other than that, I just want to thank you all for taking time out of your busy day. It was a wonderful turnout, and, and I want to thank Ethan Marcus again and the Sephardic Brotherhood, as well as the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals for co-sponsoring this event and, and just being able to bring so you know such a wide swath of the community together to be able to appreciate how we can grow as Jews and as people simply by learning more about one another. So thank you so much. And with this, I'll turn it back over to Ethan. Thank you so much, Rabbi Angel, as we say, for a wonderful Shiora class. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Like I said before, if you haven't checked out the Sephardic Digital Academy before, please do so. Go to our website at sephardicbrother.com. You can check out all other classes on Sephardic Torah, Halakha, um, Ladino language, Sephardic history, culture, cooking classes as well, book talks. So a lot of wonderful content coming up in the fall. So please do and check that out. I also mentioned a special thank you to our partners at the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals, which we work on a number of different products. We have wonderful uh, articles and content as well at producing uh, kind of forward thinking and, and diverse ideas about Judaism for an inclusive, more warm Judaism, which is very wonderful as well. Um, if you have any questions or any thoughts for future courses, please feel free to email us. You can email us at info at sephardicbrotherhood.com. And I'll take this moment now to start saying, uh, Anyada buena dulce, school and a happy, healthy New York.
to everyone. And God willing, we should have a better year, one of good health and happiness. And Rabbi Angel, thank you so much again for, for the wonderful course today. With pleasure and Shana Tava to everybody. Take care and thank you again. Thank you all so much. Thank you.